Good morning. This is Charter Moms Chat. I'm Inga Cotton. Uh, you're on the San Antonio Charter Moms page. And uh, this summer, we're talking about learning activities that families can do with their kids at home. And we've been partnering with uh, schools and local nonprofits to get information from their experts about um, things we do to keep the learning going. So today we have a guest, actually Ryan is a repeat guest. He, he came to talk to us earlier too about um, like re remote education stuff at the um, at the Briscoe. Uh, so Ryan is a curator of collections at the Briscoe Western Art Museum. Um, so he's from uh, he's from the West and grew up outside though, but he's not from Texas, he's from more up North, but uh, he spent, spent lots of time running around in the woods growing up and um, you know has that comfort level with the outdoors. <laughs> so he's worked at the Smithsonian, uh, he's worked at the Alamo, um, he is uh, great about bringing history to life. Like he will, he will dress up in costume or whatever, whatever it takes to, <laughs> to get the message across. And he is—he's a dad. He's got—he's got two kids, and he does these kinds of projects with them too. Uh, right, right. They're sort of your your test subjects for for oh, yeah. lessons, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he also says he enjoys uh, reading and leather work. So making wallets for people who probably already have wallets, but yeah, to <laughs> <laughs> something to do. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, yeah, so uh, Ryan was talking to us before about um, Beyond the Briscoe, which is the online resources that the Briscoe has. And then uh, he wrote a wonderful guest post. It's on the blog today. And uh, we titled it The West Starts Here because that's the tagline at the Briscoe. And so the link is in the description of the video. And I encourage everyone to please go go visit and you'll see um, instructions on how to do these projects. You'll get there's like a little history essay about um, San Antonio's role in the creation of North American cattle culture and as a hub for the cattle drives in the 19th century. Um, and then all these great projects that are geared for different ages. So um, so Ryan, welcome. Um, Thank you. What, what are, yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to, um, okay, so this this tagline, the West starts here. So mm -hmm. so explain how, how that relates to San Antonio and why this is a good like entry point for uh, kids to learn about the history of San Antonio. Absolutely. Well, uh, Inga, thank you for having me back again. It's wonderful to be back. Um, so the West starts here really is, it's, it's what it says. We talk about the West as starting, especially in San Antonio. And from my studies, I may have mentioned this the last time here, I feel like there are several gateways to the West. Um, St. Louis, uh, uh, obviously, um, was a huge gateway. Eastern Missouri, you, you have Independence and in St. Joe where people are heading West. Um, San Francisco Bay, the Golden Gate, right? And San Antonio, honestly, South Texas is another gateway to the West. It's where people from Mexico, the Canary Islands, like everywhere are coming, but they're pushing North, right? And what they're pushing are not only they're bringing religion, they're bringing uh, the Spanish empire, for lack of a better expression, and they're also bringing cattle with them, cattle and horses. And so these cattle are moving up, they're moving up into the missions to start with, okay? And so the native people who moved into the missions, part of their teachings were to teach them some sort of a trade. And some learned carpentry, some learned blacksmithing and masonry, and some learned how to ranch and, and do this sort of agriculture. Um, and as they're ranching, they're learning how to ride horses. They're learning how to raise cattle, right? Uh, interestingly enough, the Spanish Franciscan missionaries actually had special spurs forged for their their native uh, for the native people who were like training cattle or, or sorry, who were um, running cattle out there that would slip into the back of a moccasin. Um, very very interesting. Oh, but, yeah, there's a picture of that in the in the blog post. Like so, yes. that, that's an object that's in the collection at the Briscoe, right? It Along is. with, I mean, there's hundreds of spurs in the collection, but that one yes. in particular, I was, like, I, was, I was looking at it, and, like I was editing the image, being like. Which way is up? How does this work? Yeah. And it was like, oh, I read. I was like, that's really it's, cool. So it's it's really interesting because it's got this little heel plate and it curves up and over and it's small. You wear moccasins; yeah. they're not they're not like really sturdy like a boot, and so it's got to be small so you can still use it on just slip back in there. Um, but that's really where cattle raising started here in Texas, and it continued for years. I mean, this is this is early on, early in the 1700s. But by 1779, there's a very substantial herd out here. I mean, you think about South Texas, Texas in general, so much in terms of a grasslands, open space, perfect country for cattle. And so you have these uh, longhorns, Andalusians, all these cattle that are just are just flourishing out here in South Texas. 
And by 1779, there are enough cattle that during the American Revolution, hungry American colonial troops are needing fresh food, fresh meat. And so the Spanish uh, governor, um, oh, I forget his name. Um, Galvez, that was his name. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> he actually oh, right. that's, that's the name of the come out. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So that, that's also in the post. Is there's there, Okay. So if you're on the Riverwalk side, uh, right? So the Briscoe West River Museum is located downtown. It's kind of by the convention center. It's on the Riverwalk. So there's like the Commerce Street side and then there's the, the Riverwalk side. Hmm. Right? It's, yeah. It's on Commerce, right? Not Market. It's on uh, Market. And so market, if you go back, got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, but there's this monumental sculpture. Of, yes. of representing that 18th century cattle drive. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. It's the first one to come out of Texas and it came out of San Antonio. That was the starting point. Um, and so if you happen to go downtown and you're on the river walk, that's a, definitely a thing to see. It's a huge sculpture by T.D. Kelsey. And the thing that's so interesting too is its placement on the river uh, because blocks away, like literally within view of the museum uh, over on Navarro Street, is actually the old cattle crossing in San Antonio, in downtown San Antonio. Up until almost the 20th century, people were crossing horses and cattle and wagons in this low spot in the river. And it's right there near the uh, um, near the hotel, the Contessa Hotel. And there's a monument there uh, that you can still wow. see today. This is where people used to cross cattle in the river. And so they would take them, they drove them out uh, initially out to hungry troops in the American colonies. And later on in South Texas, especially after the Civil War, I mean, cattle drives happen intermittently throughout the 18th and 19th century um, during the gold rush and so on and so on. But really the cattle culture, the cattle drive era that we all know about really started to take place at the end of the Civil War. Um, and many of these major trails, the, the Great Western Trail, the uh, Chisholm Trail, the Shawnee Trail, these major trails, well, they didn't all go directly through San Antonio because then there would just be nothing but cattle as far as you can see, but they all would resupply, right? They would come in um, with their chuck wagons. They would come and they would resupply, or I guess supply themselves for the long journey northward. Um, some drives would go as far as Montana, some would go up just to Abilene or Dodge City, but they needed this, they needed supplies, they needed tack, they needed food, they needed all of these things. And so they drive the chuck wagon in, chuck wagons had to be stationed in Alamo Plaza uh, as a city requirement at one point, and they would buy everything that they needed because there were so many vendors and suppliers here. And so the cattle trade, cattle culture is just so tied in to San Antonio. In fact, the first demonstration, well, I guess not, maybe not the first, but one of the most prominent and most impactful demonstrations of barbed wire took place uh, in downtown San Antonio. Um, man came out and he just strung a small fence of, of barbed wire together, drove in four cattle and just left them there for a little while just to show people that, hey, look, cattle are not just going to break through this. This is an effective, inexpensive way to create a fence. And it really took off from there. I mean, that was really, in many ways, the end of the open range era was the invention of that uh, that barbed wire. But again, it was one of those things like the the cattle drives happened in South Texas, happened in San Antonio. Right, right. That's amazing. It's, it's really it's woven through um, you know, in in your post about all these things that happen that happen in San Antonio and like why. Um, yeah, I mean, because there's 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 other places in you know, in the United States that, that also had a role in cattle culture, but, but oh, San Antonio yeah. was at, present at so many key moments. And, and this is where we are, right? And we can, yeah. like, it really makes sense why, you know, why San Antonio needs an institution like the Briscoe Western Art Museum to like, to help people understand like, what is the culture of the West? And like, what are these, like the museum has these amazing artifacts that, right, like, oh. like the spurs or, um, right, like, um, you know, I, yeah, well, this is your thing. I'll, I'll let you explain, but like, you know, but like things that help people understand, like you know what? Um, yeah, well, there's an example of a chuck wagon, right? Like on the mm -hmm. is it on the third floor. That's yeah, yeah. it's up on the third floor. Yeah, and these things are so great. I mean, especially for for kids as they're starting to learn about the world we live in, the culture of especially the place where they live. It's going to be the most impactful to them to know about the culture and history of where they live. And artwork in particular is, and, and Western art for me 
the thing that's such an appeal is there are so many stories tied into that work. And the artists do such meticulous re research to make sure that their work is accurate, that it captures not only the excitement and the spirit of the West, but also that the fine details are included. Uh, just talking with so many of the contemporary artists and reading about artists like Frederick Remington and Charlie Russell, the kind of research they did to make sure that they accurately, and they're, from what they were depicting, capturing that part of the West, so important to them. And so it's that combination of artifact and artwork that really helps to bring those Western stories to life, in my opinion, and, and really bring that Western culture to life. Yeah, yeah. So in addition to the Briscoe Western Art Museum, there are, and you you mentioned this a little bit already, like there are places in San Antonio that, that tie in, right? So like mm -hmm. like the Alamo, the Missions, the Riverwalk, I guess the, the, um, the barbed wire demonstration with that that was in military plaza right which is now yes. where city hall mm -hmm. is at. yeah um and then you mentioned el camino real right so there's yeah. like, there's signs around yeah so, to, so tell us about like i mean one thing like like we're as part of our sort of charter a summer of learning project i'll go ahead and fly up that that banner like this is right. we're training encourage families like what is stuff that they can do at home i mean of oh, course like the, the briscoe is open and the but you know we have lots of activities we want families to either do stuff from home or do things that they can do like while social distancing so if there's, if there's places around san antonio that they can visit that that kind of you know bring some of this western um history to life what are, what are some examples um first of all i would say the missions are a great place to visit uh i mean san jose in particular is probably one of the more open spacious areas that you could go and i'm not sure if they're open right now that would you're gonna have to check their website yeah. but they do have some incredible resources online if you're not able to go out there to the missions these institutions their their whole goal is to try and create learning opportunities for families for the public and so when you're not able to go out there, realize that they're working very hard to make this transition to put content online, to make it accessible to the public so that you can still learn about these places that are, are right in our backyard. I mean, San Jose is miles down the road. It's very, very close as well as the other missions. Um, great places to go and visit, great things to see. The, the Alamo is one of those places too. I mean, back behind the Alamo, and even inside, I mean, if we want to talk about cattle, I mean, they drove cattle across the river during the battle. They had like 30 head of beeves inside the walls of the Alamo at a certain point. And for however long they thought they were going to end up being there. Um, but that was so intimately tied with it. The Camino Real, the, the, the King's Road, essentially, was this way of connecting Mexico and the Spanish colonies in Texas. San Antonio was one of those first crossroads. It really was. It became like old San Antonio Road because it was such a hub out here. And so San Antonio really is a crossroads um, for the history and the culture back to the its Spanish roots um, and even up until today. Um, the Riverwalk, of course, is a great place to go and visit. I mean, that was the lifeblood of, of the city from time immemorial. Native people that lived along here, that, that river was a life source, a source of food, shelter, and so on. And so realizing what, um, how much has gone into the building of this city, uh, how, what has been the history and the culture of the city from before you even had Settlers Hill here is a way of appreciating where we come from and who we are today as a, as a city. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's something, um, we talked about this before we went on air that, um, you know, there's so much uncertainty and and there, it feels like there's so many limitations of what we can do. But um, I found I found reading your post very uplifting because it it expanded my imagination about you know what San Antonio was like at different times in the past and um, and visualizing like like you know sort of this escapist mentality of like wow wouldn't it be amazing to be like go on a cattle drive and just be able to go hundreds of miles and like you know just see like to you know go to, to places where like there may be not that many other humans but just like lots of open space and you have a sense oh. of like mission and purpose and right you have to get all these cattle to this to this certain place i think that's part of what like like cattle culture is so evocative it really sparks the imagination and, and so many artists are you know try to capture that and celebrate that yeah absolutely absolutely and it is it's a great way to stir the imagination i mean i remember as a young boy growing up I, my my grandfather was a farmer, but his cousins and his relatives had cattle. And so they would run cattle up in Idaho. And um, 
well, I mean, I wasn't on the trail with him. He was always telling me stories about the West, about Western culture, about cowboys and Indians and all these things. And so, I mean, really, I can trace a lot of what I do today back to those early stories of uh, uh, sitting around and listening to my grandfather talk about things that he had done. I mean, artifacts that he had found, really bringing that culture, making it relevant for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's really what it's all about. Like, honestly, if especially at this time where we're here, we're home, we're trying to stay safe, we're trying to flatten the curve uh, for COVID-19, it's so important to try and keep our minds engaged, keep our, our spirits engaged with um, whatever we can find, whatever is fine, we find interesting. And I feel like Western stories do that. They're very exciting. They're very engaging, very interesting. Um, and so being able to kind of stir a child's imagination with that, uh, same way mine was as a kid, is a great way to kind of just, just get them started, get, keep their minds busy, keep them engaged. Because the thing that I found, especially with my own children, is that if you can wake up a child's imagination, they're going to run with it. And they're going to try and find great ways to play and create games and scenarios that keep them busy throughout the, throughout the day. Mm -hmm. That's what we, and I want to mention, we have a, a post, I, I need to add it. I'll add a link to the, the, the post about um, the West starts here, but um, for Father's Day, we had a post about storytelling between fathers and children, like how, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's all, also I'll link to that because it, it is part of, it's part of, um, you know, sharing this knowledge, right, and getting, getting their imaginations going. Okay, so I want to I want to talk about some of the specific activities mm -hmm. that that you describe in the post, and you've got different ones for different ages. So, like the one for preschoolers is about a vest, right? Yes. The one for kind of middle grades kids um, involves a pinwheel because mm -hmm. that gets you thinking about the the is it roll? Is that how you say the it? Rowl, yeah. Rowl, the okay, the rowl of a spur. Okay, and then and then, and then there's chuck wagon cooking, and you have these great photos of this like delicious like bacon and biscuits <laughs> and gravy and like oh it looks so exactly. good exactly so, yeah okay so 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 tell us more about the activities and like how families can get their kids excited about right the activity goes with the storytelling and yes. you know talking about the west yeah absolutely and so i mean a lot of what my thoughts were with this were to create um object-based learning. I mean, that's a museum expression for basically saying you take stuff and you use it to tell a story. Uh, and so for the first activity for the preschoolers, I tried to think, okay, my kids, what would they do at preschool age? They're learning to use scissors. They're, I mean, it's very, very basic. And so I thought, okay, well, what if we took some of these bags? Everyone seems to have Trader Joe's bags lying around, right? These are paper bags. It's great to have them. You try to use them or you reuse them, but inevitably they just pile up. So why not take one of them, turn it inside out, cut out a space for a head, cut a slit up the middle, a couple of armholes, and let your kindergartner or preschooler color it any way they want, design something themselves. We're going to appreciate that and then wear that. And then you can take stories. And we've got some great resources uh, for cowboy stories, um, stories about Pecos Bill and all these other things. Yeah, beyond the Briscoe, go look over there. We've got some great, even some of our fantastic educators will actually relate those stories. We have videos of them telling these stories. So go online and uh, watch them and have your youngster, your, your preschool or your kindergarten age child really start to learn about it. And they love it. They'll usually wear these things around for days. Um, and so really for them, it was just giving them the opportunity to interact with something that's a little bit different, that makes them feel a little bit like a cowboy. They're a cowgirl, right? right? Um, right. For the second activity, the pinwheel. Now, this is one I kind of have been mulling for a while. I've been trying to think about some way to create an activity that involves making spurs that kids can wear around. Uh, the best example that I had seen was not one that I came up with. I was over at the Institute of Texan Culture, another fantastic institution, um, where they had an activity that they would uh, make kind of a paper strap and then attach bells to it. All right? And that was their spur. Mm -hmm. Now, it wasn't worn around the ankles. Uh, tripping hazard there. I don't think they wanted that. They would wear The kids would wear them around their wrist. And so I thought, well, what can we do to really like bring home this idea of spurs? And so I started to think about pinwheels, right? And this is an old craft. I mean, these have been around since the 18th century. They've been uh, available for kids to play with. The video I've attached for the blog post is 
one of the best and easiest ways that kids can learn how to make these. And the more I looked at it, like, this looks like a rowel for a spur. I think we should give this opportunity to, again, use some object, object based learning, talk about spurs, and what better place to talk about spurs than San Antonio, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's cool Spur City, if, as much as it's Alamo City. And the thing is, as much as people look at the Spurs, they know the sports team, they know the logo, but do they really know what the object is and what it's for? And so I've got my own little set, and I bought this years ago. Uh, I actually bought these in Brazil. Um, but the Spurs themselves are actually quite interesting. And you have, of course, the rowel, this little bit that spins, right? Just like a pinwheel. But then you also have different parts to it, the shank, the heel strap. I mean, all kinds of things. And there are different varieties of spurs. The thing I found was so interesting is that uh, a cowboy spur, early on especially, would really be an indicator of where this cowboy comes from. Uh, does he come from California? Does he have this like beautiful silver inlay with large rowels? Does he come from Texas where they have a little bit more simple um, utilitarian type of spurs? Are they from up north? So they call them buckaroos, which is kind of a um, translation of vaquero, but it's it's anglicized, right? Uh, right? And so each style is very unique to the region. And as the cowboys would travel up the trails, they would get the opportunity to meet other cowboys. They would work for different outfits and they could start to see like, oh, hey, I kind of kind of like Texas spurs over a little bit more useful or, oh, hey, look at the those California spurs. They have these interesting little uh, uh, dangly things off the side that really give that little tinkling sound. Those are actually called jingle bobs. That's the official name for them. Um, <laughs> so just, just really fascinating and gives parents the opportunity to talk about that. And I, I, I realized after I'd sent that blog post in, it's pretty extensive. I'm working on a, sp a project about Spurs for the Briscoe right now. So I've got all this yeah. information like in my head, just got to get it out. Um, so hopefully parents, teachers, educators, can you utilize this information and not just talk about the spur for the spur's sake, but as a tool the cowboys were using, caros were using all the way back. I mean, these go back to 200 BC, back to hundreds and hundreds of years ago, people are using spurs, right? Yeah, and you have, there's a timeline chart that shows how the styles, how they got more complicated, right? Because exactly. it's, it's, it's just for a different purpose, right? They didn't yeah. even have stirrups back then. For, oh yeah. Right? Yeah, it's, it's hundreds yeah. and hundreds of years that people are trying to figure out how to control horses. And as they changed, it, it really became this, this way of um, showing not only identity and wealth and so on. Uh, in fact, even in San Antonio, for example, the uh, native people, when you have the more affluent classes that are, are riding around on their horses, um, when they have these like beautifully made Spanish spurs, they started calling them gachupines or basically spurs as a way of distinguishing them and calling, well, you're the rich folks over there. Uh, and so it became this mark of distinction, even in old San Antonio. And again, a way of telling stories using an object. And hopefully it's a way that uh, people can appreciate a little bit more and understand maybe why the sports team too, they're called the spurs. <laughs> And for that last activity, that, that cooking activity, I tried to think of something that could be a little bit more engaging, a little bit more for a mature student, right? Um, and cooking is a great way to do that, especially if you're cooking with Dutch ovens. Um, if you're cooking with a Dutch oven, now there are a few ways to do this. One, if you have the space for it, if you have a fire pit or something like that, and you have parental supervision, I highly encourage going out and actually trying to cook with the coals and the Dutch ovens. Um, don't use your cruze cast iron, use a real Dutch oven. It's not never gonna be the same if you try the other way. Um, but use that Dutch oven out in the fire, maybe something gets burned, but at least you're learning new skills and trying new things, right? If you can't, if you're not in that sort of a situation, you can still cook with Dutch ovens. Uh, cooking the bacon and the cast iron skillet, super easy. And personally, I think it tastes better. Also, too, you take the uh, the um, cracklings, the drippings from the bacon, make your gravy with that. Uh, put a great recipe on there, the one that I tried myself. I thought it came out really well. That was actually my dinner that night from the pictures that you have. Uh, <laughs> and then the biscuits, you can do a few different things. Um, if you want, you can go out and just order, get some tin biscuits, put like them in the there. In cook the them, yeah, those little, yeah. yeah, those refrigerated dough biscuits in the tube. Get those cook them up in the uh, in the Dutch oven, in your oven, 
and they work great. I mean, mine came out really nice. I was very happy with it. Cool. Uh, <laughs> but then also too, and this is something that I've, I've done with my own kids, is that if you have a family member that has a great biscuit recipe, grandmother, grandfather, whoever, get them on Zoom and actually have them teach the kids how to cook those biscuits, how to make them, what they need to do to get those perfect, like sourdough biscuits, whatever it might be, teach them how to cook from scratch. It's gonna be a great way to build family relationships, to pass on culture and heritage, and then also to, to take that and apply that to cowboy culture because these cowboy cooks that are around the, the chuck wagon, they're having to make whatever they can. Um, sometimes it's tortillas, sometimes it's biscuits, and they have to take what they what they can with them. Bacon is a, was a great thing to take with them because it was smoked, and so it would usually keep pretty well. Uh, cowboys ever got tired of, of lean beef and those longhorns when they first got out on the trail, didn't have a whole lot of fat on them, <laughs> and so the beef was kind of tough. So cowboys loved having bacon whenever they could get it. And so the camp cooks are making that. They're going to make a little bit of gravy with that. They have flour. They have the, the resources available. And so that biscuits and bacon gravy was a great thing for them to make uh, as kind of a treat for the cowboys. It's going to take a little longer to make. And so it's something, again, a way to tell those stories. Uh, we've got a few great paintings in the over at the Briscoe, um, some of my favorites, that show these scenes of the cowboys around the chuck wagon, around the campfire, and you can see it, an actual chuck wagon over at the museum. And uh, you've got it, in the post, there's a link to a video of a, um, a chuck wagon cook, right? An expert mm -hmm. chuck wagon cook, like, show, you know, talking about and showing yeah. what he does. And, yeah. and then I think you also, as an extension, you have uh, one of your colleagues at the Briscoe demonstrating how to make coffee cowboy yes. style, right? So, if you, yep. so, so like, kids can make that for their parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, he does a great job at that. That's that's especially for the parents. So <laughs> the, the old saying is that the cowboy coffee, you know, it's ready because you can throw a horseshoe in the pot and it stands up straight. So <laughs> that's how strong it should be. Yeah, the real kind. Yeah. So do these, I mean, I, I just I, I love these activities. Like, I mean, you know, you really put a lot of work effort into this. And I think I think families will be able to, like, keep coming back and um because we don't know how long we're going to be stuck at home, right? So but I, I feel really proud to have this content, you know, that the families can keep revisiting. And, and it helps, like you said, it builds, it builds family relationships if you can, you know, have multiple generations cooking, even if it's over Zoom. Absolutely. And, and it, it can tie, you know, tie people in with San Antonio or, you know, their, if their parents or grandparents grew up in Texas or in the West, yeah. you know, to, to tie in family history with, um, you know, like the artifacts in the museum and, and these stories about, you know, what, what life was like uh, on the frontier back then. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. And so we'll, for, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, and, and also too, I mean, like you say, because we don't know how long we're going to be here, we don't know how long the, the pandemic is going to last. I know there's a lot of parents right now. We're trying to figure out what next, what do I, what, what can I do to keep my kids yeah. busy? Um, and one of the resources we have, we have Beyond the Briscoe. That content is still being generated. Check it out. Uh, I mean, we have, for the past two months, every week, we've really tried to create something new and engaging uh, with all our muse museum staff getting involved and trying to create something that would be useful for parents, uh, would would give them a different perspective on, on an aspect of the West, everything from native culture, Spanish, Mexican culture, wildlife, whatever, it's there. The artwork is there. Go and take a look at that. Um, furthermore, something that we're doing coming up is we have, in the past, we've had a big gathering at the end of July, National Day of the Cowboy. Mm -hmm. It's been one of our signature uh, community events, right? And unfortunately, due to the circumstances surrounding the pandemic, that's not going to be possible this year. And so what we've had to do is try to rethink that. We're, we're reimagining that for this year and have created, our educators have created this new program. Uh, tell you a little bit about that, which is the uh, uh, behind, oh, Bring Home the Briscoe. Uh, I had to make sure I got that name right. They worked so hard on it. Um, but Bring Home the Briscoe is a series of four kits that really engage kids. Uh, the fourth subjects that we, we try and cover, the wildlife, uh, Native American heritage, Spanish and Mexican heritage, as well as uh, the cowboy culture that we've been discussing here. Now, these kits have multiple activities, 
options like reading options, storytelling options, uh, and they tie it back to some of the artwork in the museum as well. And these kits, these activities, kids can, families can order these for their children and bring them home. Yeah. And so you can order these through the museum store. Um, you can order them online and they're $20 per kit. And they're actually pretty extensive, pretty interesting kits. You bring these home and it's kind of like a summer camp at home, right? You bring that down. Uh, you actually can come and pick them up over at the museum with no contact uh, delivery, uh, roadside or curbside pickup, I guess. <laughs> right. And they're $20 for members and they're $25 for non-members. Now, if you want to get all, oh, now this is per kit. If you want to get all four, it's going to be $75 uh, for members and $90 for non-members. Now, there's also they're also running a special right now that if you are not a member currently, but you've kind of been thinking about it, then what you do is you sign up for a membership right now and you actually get one of these kits free for each membership that you purchase. And so Ooh. you can arrange that. Yeah, and you can arrange with the museum to come down again and pick up that curbside pickup for the kits. Um, and it really is a wonderful program. It, it, it brings the, the culture of the West, the art of the West to life, but it brings you together in your home. And so I wholeheartedly recommend that, especially right now. I mean, I know it's hard. I, I personally, I understand how hard it can be having kids at home and trying to think of things for them to do at this time. We're all trying to stay safe but we all want to stay sane too. So, <laughs> and so it's important. Yeah. For the kids. And that goes for the kids too. They want interesting things to do. And so being able to create something, being able to have these art projects that also relate to history, give them multiple ways of understanding the West, understanding their heritage. It's so important. But unfortunately too, we also have many children in the community they can't afford this at all. Uh, and so what we're doing, too, is a, a secondary program called Briscoe Buddies, in which we're trying to bring many of these kits to nonprofit organizations. Uh, Boys and Girls Club of America, Haven for Hope, St. PJ's Children's Home, Mission Road. And we're taking these kits over to these kids who right now are going as crazy as everyone else and also trying to stay safe. And so we're, we're, we're trying to give back to the community in a way. And for anyone that's interested and anyone that is able to donate to this cause, we also have those options, those links available online. You can go to our website, you can donate to uh, Briscoe Buddies, which is frankly one of the, the things that we're trying to do to help the rest of our community get through this very difficult time. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. So I'm gonna recap. So um so the National Day of the Cowboy is usually a really big event at the Bristol, yeah. right? And uh, I, I know that there's people easily interactive activities, day. demonstrations, right? Like Native American mm -hmm. performances of dance and drumming, and things, right? So it's normally a really big deal, right? And it's mm -hmm. it's in it's normally in late July. So so instead you guys have um, bring home the Briscoe, right? So that you said there's four different art kits, cowboy, wildlife, Native American culture, Spanish culture. Um, those sound amazing. Okay, so the price per kit is 20 for members, 25 for non-members, or you can bundle four kits, 75 for members, 90 for non-members. But if somebody gets a, if they sign up for a new membership, yeah. they get a kit with their membership, which is they amazing. Do, correct. Um, and you said it's it's curbside, so it's contactless. It's curbside, like, yep. You can order through July, okay. and it is curbside pickup. Okay, and um, let's see, that's good to mention because these videos will be up for a while. So, but at least through uh -huh. July, right? Which is yes. that makes sense for National Day of the Cowboy. Um, and you said that the Briscoe is working with nonprofits to make sure that even the children whose families can't afford to buy the kits, that some of them still have access to it because we're all and you encourage people if they if they are have the means to donate because it supports the Briscoe providing uh, Briscoe Buddies kits to these nonprofits. I think it's Absolutely. wonderful. Yeah, and we're all in this situation. I know I'm I'm feeling it today for some reason. It, it, you know, some days are easier than others, but today Absolutely. today is one of those days where I feel I feel a little more discouraged than usual. And that's but that's where I'm really glad that our team has been working on presenting these projects because. If kids, if you know something, something new, it's like, hey, we've got mm -hmm. this box. Let's see what's in yeah. this box, right? Something like that can can just turn it turns the mood around for the whole day. You know, that's something. Yeah, I think learning is one of the best antidotes for this feeling of uncertainty and feeling kind of feeling cooped up. Yes, exactly. 
Because it, <laughs> it, it is hard some days, but anytime you can bring something new into the day-to-day -day monotony, that's going to be exciting. That's going to be really exciting. I mean, kids love getting a box of anything. So anytime you can bring something new, it really does help. So, yeah. 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 Wonderful. Well, Ryan, I'm really grateful. Like, I mean, the blog post has lots of great stuff for kids to do. Um, I'm going to embed this video in the blog post so people, they can, you know, get this extra dimension, you know, of, you know, the storytelling, you know, that goes with uh, the activities. And I'm really glad that the Briscoe is, is doing so much to adapt to this environment, but to still keep, you know, stick with the mission of, you know, using art to educate people about the culture of the West. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you have any closing thoughts before I wrap up the video? Yes. Yeah, I mean, for right now, um, the Briscoe is still open. We are encouraging people to stay safe, follow city guidelines, uh, do everything you can to keep yourself and others safe. Um, we are, for those, if anyone comes, yes, masks, right? we're requiring masks. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, so wear your mask, practice good social distancing, stay safe. And in the meantime, immerse yourself in Western art, stories, music, culture, whatever. We're all trying to get through this together and uh, we'll be here for you, especially when we come out the other side. So thank you all so much. Inga, thank you for having me on again. This has been such a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, what a great message. Thank you so much, Ryan. Absolutely, absolutely. Good job with you too. Yeah, okay. Sounds great. Bye.